As we begin this second part of our series on the happy theme of heaven, let us seek the Lord's blessing in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee that we can call Thee by that name. We know that is Thy dwelling place and that Thou hast opened a way in the blood of Emmanuel to reconciliation and faith and being made accepted in the beloved, chosen of God. We pray that Thou will help us not only to understand the magnificence of Thy presence and that of the saints in heaven, but to feel something, have a foretaste of it as we listen together in our description that we find in Thy Word with the help of Thy servant, who we believe is in heaven with Thee, enjoying the unspeakable glory and grace of God even now. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let me say this uh, word of uh, transition from our comments on hell and our comments on uh, heaven. Sometimes, uh, with respect to Edwards in particular, but preachers of hell in general, they are referred to as scare preachers or scare theologians, and sometimes are slanderously reported as thinking they can scare people into heaven. We've already noticed the fact that they frequently insist that ministers exaggerate for effect and so on. And Edwards has said very plainly that is utterly impossible, and we all recognize that there is a hell. No preacher can possibly exaggerate its horror and so on. But the rationale for preaching hell In the first place is a preacher is supposed to be the steward of the mysteries of God, and that includes hell. But Edwards would usually ask the question and feel around, why does God reveal hell? Why does He commission His servants to preach the awesome doctrine, which every one of us would shrink from and be glad to be freed of, if it were possible, and which Christ Himself said more about than anyone else in the Bible, as much as to indicate that the Son of God Himself took this awesome burden on Himself. But when Edwards would ask the question, why did God do this? The idea was never to scare anybody into heaven. That's absolutely out of the question. You can't do it. If it were possible, hell would do it, but there's no such thing as turning a person to God by simply frightening Him legitimately with what will happen if he isn't turned to God. Well, what is the rationale besides faithfulness to God's commission? Well, Edwards has a great deal to say about that. It's fundamentally in terms of awakening. I'm sure you have all heard of the Great Awakening in New England. Started in 1734 in Edwards' own congregation under his own uh, preaching, spread all over Massachusetts and Connecticut and elsewhere, but came to its head in the preaching of uh, George Whitfield, especially in 1740. Well, what did awakening mean? Awakening simply meant that sinners, who are normally, to use a Puritan term, sottish, set in their ways, satisfied to have a good job and a good wife and a good family and good health and good income and such things as that, and couldn't care less about the world to come, These soddy sinners are awakened to the fact that every moment they're walking over these boards which can give under their weight at any minute, and they fall right straight into hell. Now, once they become convinced of that, there's one thing they are not going subsequently to be, and that is soddish and indifferent. They are going to be awakened to their danger, and they're going to think about their relationship to God and the peril of it and how it can be changed. That's not a saving thing. But manifestly, if people don't think about it and don't listen to it, and faith comes only by hearing, then manifestly they are not going to be converted. The rationale for hell, in other words, was heaven. It was to get people thinking about the horror which threatened them if they weren't converted. 
He also could paint some very, as you'll see here, beautiful pictures of heaven so that the sinner who realized he's going to lose out on it could drool with envy, but he knew very well. Sinners aren't really concerned with spiritual blessing, but they are concerned with avoiding physical and mental miseries. That will move them if anything will, but it won't move them to heaven. It will move them to thinking about heaven and how to get to heaven and so on. So please understand that. A scare preacher who is a true scare preacher is scaring people because that is the truth that they are in danger and that scaring is to get them to thinking about salvation and seeking the Lord and having their heart change. Edwards never had any notion that he could scare anybody into salvation, but he could scare people into thinking about salvation and seeking salvation that much, and that's as much as a minister could do. Now, number one, Edwards did preach hellfire sermons. He also wrote lyrically beautiful expressions of his appreciation of nature, and he saw no contradiction in doing both. The God who created the world with all its beauty was also the God of perfect holiness, and a holy God must punish sin. These inseparably connected. It's the holiness of God, which you've heard R.C. preach and write and so on so much. It was the holiness of God, which spelled hell if a person were not made holy himself, and which is the quintessence of heaven if a person actually becomes like God, a holy person himself. Two, for Edwards, heaven was a manifest implication of the atonement. He, quote, whose arms are open to suffer to be nailed to the cross will doubtless be opened as wide to embrace those for whom he suffered. He has some writing on the satisfaction of Christ, and he goes into scholastic detail to show that that's quite sufficient to remove the guilt of the world, if it were necessary, and to reconcile sinners. But he also can wax... Uh, uh, what do you call it? Sentimental? Uh, affectionate? This way, and just simply say, can you imagine Christ stretching out his arms to die and be unwilling to accept you? The, the, it was incongruous to think that he who would have stretched out his arms on the cross would actually not be willing to save people, uh, unable to bring them to heaven. In other words, what proves heaven be the fact that the Bible says it, but what proves the legitimacy of heaven, the fact that sinners who deserve hell could actually be made fit, which is a very favorite term of uh, Edwards, by the way, fit, appropriate, suited to heaven, is the fact that the divine Son of God suffered for you. That answers all problems, really, about hell and heaven. Hell, that, that would be necessary to deliver from it. Heaven, that that would certainly ground eternal blessedness beyond any power to describe or imagine. Now, the actual location of heaven is where Christ is, number three. The communion of the God-man is that of which they shall eat and drink abundantly and swim in the ocean of love and be eternally swallowed up in the infinitely mild and sweet beams of divine love, eternally receiving the light, eternally full of it, and eternally compassed round with it, and everlastingly reflecting it back again to its fountain. <coughs> now, those of you who don't know Edwards, except as a preacher of sinners in the hands of an angry God, and the last three lectures we've given here, and so on, may be surprised to find that kind of note in him. But it's, uh, it's like comparing him to Dante. Edwards never wrote a line of poetry, and yet he's quite frequently compared uh, to Dante because of this kind of literature, this kind of uh, sentiment which people recognize. Some people have real difficulty understanding how a person could write so exquisitely about the joyousness, uh, 
swallowing in it, being swallowed up by it, and so on, and the frightful terror of damnation. But these are both true. God's presence is hell. God's presence is heaven. And if you can't exaggerate the torments of an angry God, you can't exaggerate the blessedness of a reconciled God who loves you enough to send His Son, which Son loves you enough to spread His arms on the cross for your redemption. <laughs> if I may descend from the sublime to the ridiculous, I remember somebody, I, I think I know his name, but I'm not sure, so I won't mention the name, but uh, he was commenting on all this sweetness and light in Jonathan Edwards. He got a little uh, nauseated with it, especially when he thought that he was a kind of political antinomian. He wasn't doing enough uh, uh, to change the political order. You may guess who the <laughs> utterer of this statement is if I tell you much more than that. But the point is, he was recognizing something that's a notable feature in, in Edwards. And Edwards is talking constantly about sweetness and light. And this man went on to say, the dieters among these people must have gotten pretty well turned off by his constant talking about so much sweetness and so on. But that is a very favorite uh, word. I remember once when I was doing some work on Edwards, a German scholar was there. He was just trying to track down the use of the word light in Edwards. It occurs constantly. And I don't know that anybody's written on sweetness, but this is, uh, this is real Edwards. Uh, it seems incongruous to some people. But uh, I think the reason it seems incongruous is that they have, for the most part, even when they believe in hell, dismissed it from their thinking. And when they know that Edwards hasn't dismissed it from their thinking, they fancy, because they have, when they think about the sweetness of heaven, it's because they have rejected the terrors of hell. They can't quite imagine that a man who puts the emphasis he does on the terrors of hell could still say so very much about the light and the joy and the sweetness and the being swallowed up in it. This is a problem in Edwards, incidentally, that I mention as an aside. Some people say he can't escape from pantheism, that he has people so wrapped up in God and so much an extension of God and so much his emanation remanating to him and his end for which God created the world that they can't understand how he could avoid pantheism. But he did avoid pantheism. But the very fact that people wonder how he can, and some actually put this uh, blame at his door, that he is a kind of Meister Eckhart, he is a kind of uh, a pantheist, you can see where they get this, uh, this idea. Now, in this particular case, it's obvious if there's any pantheism here, it's between the redeemed and the Lord. You'd realize immediately that uh, the denizens of hell couldn't be a part of the blessed joyousness of God, and yet you are reminded for the fifth time that it's God's presence in hell which makes it so frightfully terrible, and so on. So there is a sense in which he is, but I just mentioned that just as a problem which some uh, uh, theologians and f philosophical theologians see in Edwards, and this much is true. He does put that kind of emphasis here that it suggests such a thing as that. If you know Edwards, you know full well that would be an ultimate uh, heresy for him. He'd oppose to it, but uh, even Charles Hodge had a little trouble with him on that point. Number four, he starts to talk now about the recognition of other people in heaven. Wonderful as is the fellowship of the saints with their God and Savior, this does not exclude their delight in one another. There is no reason to think, he says, that the friendships contracted here on earth between saints that have been sanctified by the love of God will be rooted out in another world. I call your attention not only to the fact that he emphasizes that, but it's interesting the reason he gives for it. Namely, there is no reason for assuming it. It's a good thing that we have communion of saints is a good thing, and heaven is a place where all good things are made perfect, so why would you think it would be rooted out? Why wouldn't you rather assume, on the contrary, that it would be very much in evidence and present because 
It's a good thing made perfect. And the place for good things made perfect, of course, is uh, a heaven. He doesn't go into a great deal of argument on that, but uh, number five, saints will recognize fellow saints in heaven, and their love for each other will be perfected. This was one of his tenderest tributes to his wife, Sarah. He uh, fell in love with her uh, when she was just a girl about 13, and when he had his first full pastorate in Northampton, he wrote back to the girl he left behind, a daughter of a minister in New Haven, to be his wife, which she did. They had a very uh, beautiful marriage, crowned with 11 children, all of which, except one, seems to have been a saint. Edwards once said on one occasion that when the Spirit seemed to have been withdrawing himself from his congregation in Northampton, he was almost consoling Edwards personally with a special visitation of his own family. There was a time when a number of his own children, Edwards felt, were being savingly brought home uh, to God. Jerusha was the fairest in his garden, he said. She was the one who was engaged to David Brainerd and nursed him to, uh, till he died and died shortly after of his own uh, ailment, consumption, and so on. But when Edwards himself, you know, and his uh, let me remind you, for 23 years he was pastor at Northampton, Massachusetts, until he was dismissed by the congregation in 1750, ostensibly because he believed that the Bible forbade admitting people to the communion unless they gave a profession of saving faith. We're not, you know, this isn't a total course on Edwards, you know, it's Edwards in relationship to heaven and hell, so I can't get into all these details, but he did unlike his predecessor, Solomon Stoddard, believed that you could not legitimately come to the Lord's table, nor be knowingly admitted to the Lord's table by a minister if you didn't profess a work of grace in your heart. You may be surprised that anybody would be dismissed from a church for believing that, because you may never have heard any other doctrine than that, but that was the main reason. And then he was dismissed uh, virtually. I mean, he had to find a place to live with his large family, and the only place he could find was a little Indian village 50 miles west in Stockbridge, uh, Massachusetts, where there were a few white settlers who were related to the people who'd driven him out of, Mass out of uh, Northampton. And then after seven years there, when he wrote his greatest books, you could see what God was up to. He took him away from a busy, rather hectically busy revivalist center in uh, Northampton to be the pastor. He was the greatest educator America ever had, teaching people who could hardly read or write by an interpreter, as a matter of fact, and so on, and a few uh, uh, enemies of the uh, white uh, race uh, there. But during those seven years, he wrote his greatest work and was recognized uh, abroad as well as here and called to be the president of what is today Princeton University, and shortly after he got there, and before his wife and family were able to make the long overland journey, uh, he died. But before he died, he asked uh, those around to remember him to his wife, Sarah, uh, saying that he believed that the relationship between him and her was a truly spiritual one, and that he believed would exist uh, forever. That was his way of personalizing this communion of, uh, of saints. She was a truly spiritual woman, and uh, utterly devoted to the principles of truth, and both of them reared their children and were remarkably blessed by God in that. But that is his last word, saying to the children who weren't present that they should turn their trust in a God who would never leave, uh, God a Father who would never leave them, but to be remembered to his wife as one with whom he believed he would have a spiritual communion in heaven uh, forever. And he believed that with many of his other friends and all Christian people who loved one another in this world would love one another in the world to come and uh, all the more perfectly. Number six, heaven is everywhere in Scripture represented as the throne of God and that part of the universe that is God's fixed abode and dwelling place, and that everlastingly appropriated in that use. You see, especially in the Old Testament, God was revealed at Hebron and at Bethel and, uh, and the tabernacle in the temple, and ultimately in the incarnation. But the place where He was reflected permanently, and His glory, His Shekinah, as it were, were manifested 
constantly was in heaven, and Edwards believes the Bible supports the idea that that is always God's dwelling place. He never moves for the manifestation. He's, of course, the heaven of heavens can't contain him. He is infinite and omnipresent. But as far as the manifestation of himself in saving grace, that is in heaven, always has been in heaven, and always will be in heaven. And that is the ultimate definition uh, of heaven. Number eight, the saints are like so many vessels of differing sizes cast into a sea of happiness where every vessel is full. This is eternal life for a man ever to have his capacity Fill spiritual capacity in this case. This was Edwards' way of explaining Paul's metaphor of the stars of differing brilliance shining in the same heaven, 1 Corinthians 15, 40, 41. You see, it's the same picture. In hell, everybody is full to capacity. In heaven, everybody is full of blessedness. But the same parallel uh, comes in uh, number nine. What determines the differing capacities? We know what determines the different capacities of the saints, of the sinners in hell, namely their various actual sins. They have the same original sin. And so here, they, uh, the saints have the same original righteousness, that which is imputed by Christ. All of us here who believe in Christ have identically the same. But we do serve Him differently, some better, some uh, worse, but all of us serve Him, and the, the capacity which we're going to have in the world to come, according to Jonathan Edwards, as he understands the Bible, and Paul in particular, is in direct relation to the good works, very imperfect, but having the root of the matter in them, as Calvin would say, that we do in this world. Everyone, whether his capacity be great or small, We'll have it filled. Here again is that fitness idea again. You see, it's exactly what we're capable of is what we'll have. We'll be full of the Spirit of Christ, the joy of Christ. If you ask yourself the question, as Edwards would ask in some of his sermons, well, won't uh, those who have less of the joy of the Lord, perfectly full to be sure, but less than someone else, be jealous because somebody has more joy than you have, or may those who have more love not be inclined to look down condescendingly on someone less endowed. We know that's our problem in this world. Get a person with great gifts, and he's tempted to be conceited. Get a person of slight endowment, and that person is likely to bury his few talents in the ground or become very envious of other people. But in the world to come, oh no. The more love a person has, the further he'd be removed from any despising of anybody else. He would love that person far more than the person loves himself. And so far from someone who has less capacity, envying an individual who has more, on the contrary, because he's full of love, and he sees more love in that person, his love goes out to him all the more. So there are always these gradations. There are always these differences. There's never any equalizing in the sense of making the same, but there is an equalizing in the sense that each one, without a solitary exception in heaven, will be as full of joy, of goodness, of wisdom, love as he or she is capable of being. That's the great blessing. And I may say, as you can imagine, now I don't think I mentioned this little outline here, that is made by Edwards to be a tremendous incentive for each one of us to abound in the works of the Lord. If a cup of cold water is going to have its reward, just as an idle word is going to have its judgment, just as truly as a sinner will avoid every idle word, just so truly a saint will give as many cups of cold water as he can and will do as much good 
in the service of Christ as he can. Now, here again is a point which we discuss in modern ethics. And again, ethics is something, it's Edwards' uh, work on the nature of true virtue uh, is in, quite important and is widely studied by secular ethicists as well as, uh, as Christian ones. He's aware of what seems to us 20th century people as a current problem that people will always say, if you're doing something for a profit, is it not necessarily selfish and sinful? And so on. But he mentioned that profit in this case is more of the Lord. This is a, exactly what you ought to do, and you ought to do what's good, knowing full well it's going to bring an eternal blessedness to you in direct relation to the amount of it which you actually do. But it, so far from it being a, a, a selfish goal, apart from the true goal, this desire for, uh, to be blessed by doing greater works simply makes the person more capable of enjoying the summum bonum, the one who is altogether good, the absolutely holy God. So it's the truest possible kind of virtue to lay up treasure for yourself in heaven, as none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself says. It's an interesting thing to me, of course, that people in the name of Christ will sometimes oppose prophet seeking. But Christ is the one who says, lay up prophet, because he's talking about spiritual prophet. We was like, dear me, I thought you were getting interesting there for a while. Wall Street or something. Wall Street's a child's play. Wall Street comes and goes. We're talking about a prophet which is forever. This is eternal capitalism, if you please, the best kind of capitalism. But it, you can see, incidentally, why it does grow into a secular, contemporary, this world capitalism as well. The principle is the same. But if you were talking economically about capitalism and being responsible for whatever you have to make it grow from two to five, from five to ten, and such things as that, in the economic world, it's manifestly even more appropriate in the spiritual world as uh, well. Number ten. I think I can go to that finally. There's an interesting quote from a miscellany I won't take time for. Nevertheless, in Miscellany 367, Edwards clearly teaches that the different rewards of the saints in the world to come are related to their works in this world. Are their good works then only arbitrary determinations of God's sovereign pleasure? The answer is that these good works, I put in quotes because they're not perfectly good works, but they have the root of the matter in them, are not strictly good at all in themselves, as, as Calvin would say that, in God's sight, the heaven is not chaste, and so on. It's only the sovereign pleasure of God to regard them as, as such uh, and reward them accordingly, not meritoriously. Though it be true that the saints are rewarded for their good works. See, he's wrestling with this particular question. How can there be such a thing as a reward when we obviously don't deserve anything? This is the way he puts it in the final statement here. Though it be true that the saints are rewarded for their good works, yet it is for Christ's sake only, and not for the excellency of their works in themselves considered, because they're not excellent in themselves considered. Nobody here has ever done a work which in itself considered is excellent. Nobody ever has, according to Edward, or be held separately from Christ, for so they have no excellency in God's uh, uh, sight. I guess uh, pretty near the end of this uh, lecture at the moment. I've got a minute or two. Maybe I can get this uh, uh, concept over here. I shouldn't have skipped number nine there, except the pressure of time uh, uh, here. What he is saying is that the atonement is common to all of us who believe, and we have the same justification. That's entirely the work of Jesus Christ. But we differ in the degree of service to him or the time of service, or the quality of service to Him. We are absolutely the same as far as His atonement is concerned, but we are absolutely different as far as our service to Him is concerned, and we are going to be rewarded, not according to the atonement, but according to the works we do. Edwards no sooner says that than he realizes that on the surface of it, that sounds deeply heretical because no one does anything really meritorious. So he explains 
follow this carefully, in the spirit of Augustine, these are rewards of grace. We don't deserve anything because we give a cup of cold water in Christ's name, or because we preach Christ, or because we lead somebody to Christ, or because we pray for somebody, or do this or do that. We don't deserve anything that way. And it isn't even the product of Christ's atonement, but what it is, is God arbitrarily deciding when He distributes rewards in the world to come, to do so in relationship to, not on the basis of, the good works which you do. There's no merit in them. These are rewards of grace. You see, the dispensationalists and the Romanists both go off on this and think that you actually earn your reward in heaven, even if your justification comes from the atonement. No, no, no! You never earn anything. It's all a gift. But one is a gift of justification by the atonement. The other is a gift of the sovereign God who arbitrarily, without any merit on your part, distributes rewards in the world to come in relation to, but not on the basis of the merit of, your good works. And thus endeth the first lecture on that glorious heaven waiting those who do believe.